So, so far, uh, in the previous video, we looked at how to fill out this uh, next state table for this particular sequential systems, and we came up with a Boolean expression for the inputs J0, K0, J1, K1, and the final output Q1, Q0. In this, in this uh, video, we're going to look at uh, creating the circuit and trying to figure out the timing parameters. So, okay, so here's our Boolean expressions for J0, K0, J1, K1, and the final output Q1, Q0. Here's a JK flip-flop, first JK, second flip-flop connected to a common clock. We have our input and our system output right here. For this, we have one OR gate, one AND gate, and a second AND gate here, so let's place them first. Now we can wire J0 to input, K0 to this OR gate with input OR Q1. Uh, J1 will be input and Q0, and K1 will be Q0, so let's do that. Here's a complete circuit uh, diagram wired up. Now, in this case, uh, we should we let's go ahead and look at some timing parameters. Okay, so let's assume that the delays of different combinational logic, whether we use it here or not, are given right here. This is the maximum timing propagation delay, and this is the minimum propagation delay, also known as contamination delay for the logic gates. For the JK flip-flop, the setup time, the hold time, the propagation clock to queue time, or also known as the maximum propagation time, and TCCQ, which is a contamination clock to queue time, also known as the minimum propagation delay time. Okay. Now we have two timing parameters. First is something called a setup constraint, which basically says, in order for me to, on an edge of a clock, to make sure that the data is ready here, to be set up on the next clock as to go to, into this flip-flop, I must have the data come pass through the first flip-flop, pass through the first set of combination logic, and get there before the setup time of the second flip-flop. Okay, so that is given my T clock. This is the clock period. Propagation delay of the first flip-flop, propagation delay of the largest combinational path, and the setup time of the receiving flip-flop. And then, while we do this, while this allows us to choose a clock period, uh, we also need to make sure that we do not violate the whole time constraint. For instance, imagine that this is the second flip-flop, and this is the first flip-flop we're talking about. While data is going through this first flip-flop and through the set of combinational logics and arrives here, it is possible that it takes minimum time to go through here and the minimum time of this gate to get here. If those two minimum times add up and they're quicker and the data gets here quicker than the whole time of the second flip-flop, the old value that needs to be stored in this flip-flop will be overwritten and this flip-flop might or might not store the correct value that needed to be stored. So there's a whole time constraint which specifies that the whole time of the second flip-flop or the receiving flip-flop must be less than or equal to the minimum time taken to go through the first set of first flip-flop and the minimum time of a wire or minimum time of the quickest path from the end of the first flip-flop to the start of the second flip-flop. Okay? So and so let's analyze the different paths here. So I have a, so we'll look at, when we analyze the path, we'll look at from a input from the, from one flip-flop to the input of the second flip-flop. So in this case, we have from here to this AND gate to this uh, input J1 right here. <coughs> we have, uh, let's see, from here to K1 right here. So we have two paths, this path and this path. Now of these two paths, this first path is going to be longer because it, because it has an AND gate. Okay. And now there's one more path which is from Q1 right here through this OR gate into K0. The delay of the AND gate and the OR gate are both given to be 30 nanoseconds. So it doesn't matter whether we choose this path or this path. The total combinational delay, the longest combinational delay in any of these three paths. This path from Q0 to J1, 
q0 to k1 or from q1 to k0, the longest propagation delay is 30 nanoseconds. Okay, so 30 nanoseconds. That's this value right here. The setup time, both flip-flops are identical. So if Q1 is the first flip-flop and this is the second flip-flop, setup time we're looking at is for this flip-flop. If we're looking for data going from, from here into J1, which the setup time is for this flip-flop. But it doesn't matter because in both cases, they're the same JK flip-flop. So the setup time is 10 nanoseconds. So that's 10. This is 30. Now, the TPCQ for the JK flip flop is 40. So this says the clock cycle must be greater than or equal to 80 nanoseconds. Okay, that's my clock period. And 80 nanoseconds that translates to a maximum frequency of. Twelve point five megahertz. Okay. Maximum frequency of that. Now let's also verify that the whole time constraint is not violated. Now in this case, of these three combinational paths between the two flip flops, the shortest path is this path right here. This is the shortest path because there's no combinational element, so the proper common Contamination delay, if we assume that the wires have zero delay, the delay of this path right here is zero. The contamination delay here is zero. So in that case, this is zero. The minimum time taken to go through either from through this flip-flop is 30 nanoseconds, so that's 30. And our whole time is given as 20 nanoseconds. So since 30 is greater than 20, we do not have a violation. So no, vi no whole time, no violation of the whole time. Okay. So this is what we have. No violation of the whole time. Now what happens what happens if you were told if we were told that there could potentially be some kind of skew let's say a skew of 20 nanoseconds so let's imagine we could have a skew a skew of 20 nanoseconds. Okay, so this is 20. A maximum possible skew of 20 nanoseconds. How does that affect uh, the clock period and the whole time uh, constraint? In that case, if we have a skew of 20 nanoseconds, we have the clock period needs to be able to accommodate for that screw skew, so we need to be able, we need to increase this clock period by 20 nanoseconds to cover the worst case. So our clock period will increase to 100 nanoseconds. So this will be 100 nanoseconds. That means our frequency in presence of skew of 20 nanoseconds will be reduced from 12.5 megahertz to 10 megahertz. Now let's look at our whole time constraint. Without skew, we don't have to. Without skew, this was the Boolean expert. Uh, this was the expression: the fastest time through the first flip flop, the uh, time uh, through the second, uh, or the uh, the combinational delay uh, must be greater than uh, t hole. Right? In the presence of skew. <coughs> The clock, in the worst case scenario, the clock here will come earlier than the clock here. So this is the worst case scenario for a whole time constraint. So that means I've already started, my whole time here is 20 nanoseconds. My second clock starts later. So here's my TCCQ, which, which is 30, uh, plus, a, plus the TCD, which is 0. If somehow this total time is greater, then I have a problem. 
So basically, the whole time now, uh, needs in the worst case scenario gets reduced by 20 nanosecond here. So 30. Um, sorry. Uh, in this case, this becomes minus 20. So 20 is no longer less than 30 minus 20, which is 10. So we could potentially have a whole time violation. In that case, we can fix that by adding NOT gate, another NOT gate here. So two NOT gates buffers so that the signal is not inverted. And that will give us. Uh, uh, we actually need four because we need we need four NOT gate buffers here. The delays will add up to 20 nanoseconds, which will cancel the skew, uh, the total number of, amount of time for skew. Okay. Now let's say that our frequency was 12.5 megahertz. How do we generate that? How do we generate this particular frequency? We can there's multiple options. One option is to use a 555 timer. 555 timer is a very versatile uh, integrated circuit design, circuit chip. We can use it for a lot more uh, purpose than just generating a clock frequency. In this case, we'll configure it uh, in this setting to generate a clock output. So we have two resistors RA and RB, uh, a capacitor C, and another capacitor here. The value of this C the value of RA and RB will give us the frequency uh, that's produced at the output. And uh, the discussion of how this 555 timer does is beyond the scope of today's, uh, today's video. Um, maybe we'll tackle that some of the time. But here, on a 555 timer wired up in this setting, the T1, which is the high time, and the T2 are determined by these equations right here. So positive time is 0 0.693 times RA, RB times C. Negative time, which is T2, or the bottom half, is 0 0.693 times RB times C. So the total frequency is given as 1.44 RA plus 2 RB times C. So if you have the frequency of 12.5 megahertz, you can generate this by choosing appropriate values as R and R's and B's. And the easiest way to do that is to either choose C and figure out what R A and R B should be. And you can make R A and R, R, A and R B the same values. Or you can fix R A, R B and choose a value of C. It's one of those uh, there's multiple options to generate this particular frequency using different combinations of R A's and R B's. Generally in a 555 timer, the value of R and RB should be at least about 10 kilo ohms. Nice.